Welcome to today's Wed Web Chat. I'm Kanan Chandran, the publisher of StormAsia.com, and this is a regular series of discussions where we talk about all sorts of things, things that are topical, things that are current, uh, things that are enjoyable, sometimes a bit challenging, and um, there's so many things to talk about, right? One of the key things that people are concerned about would be the state of the economy, the costs of living, um, where is the future? There's so many disruptions taking place. How do we uh, navigate all that? How do we find our space within that whole realm of changes that are, are reshaping the world? Um, if we look at the statistics, there are a lot of uh, people who are displaced. Uh, they've uh, lost their jobs. They're looking for new things to do. Uh, I think uh, in uh, in Singapore alone, according to MOM statistics last year, it was double the number of redundancies uh, compared to the previous year. So there are clear signs that things are um, becoming a lot more uncertain for a lot of people. Um, and many of them then start their own thing. So, you know, today's session is about, so you want to start a business. And the thing is, why do you want to start a business? If you look at it, there are many reasons, right? Sometimes it's fashion. There's something you feel you need to do, you have to do it, and so you do it, and you try it and see where it goes. Uh, sometimes it's the only thing you know how to do, and if you've been displaced, then you just carry on in that space, um, and you try and build something out of that. Sometimes you inherit a family business. Sometimes, in that case, then you're saddled with what you've got to work with, and you've got to make something of it, right? Or you'll have a lot of family noises coming at you. Um, uh, in some instances, a bunch of like-minded people come together and build something, start something, they spot something and they just go with that. Um, the knowledge that you have is sometimes a key factor in helping you decide, all right, I'm going to pursue this and go for that. Um, but sometimes you just don't want to work for somebody else. You don't like work, the idea of working for somebody else. So you go start your own thing. So <clears throat> then... Of course, then there are the redundancy, uh, those who are made redundant. Uh, and in a tough economy, you've got to figure out what else you want to do. So there are many reasons for getting into uh, your own business. And today's panelists uh, have their own reasons, which we will find out about, for getting into a variety of different industries. So let me very quickly uh, explain who they are in today's panel. Okay, We've got Christopher Chu, who is from Aventura. Um, he will, after 30 years in the media and entertainment industry with TCS, where he was the executive producer of shows like Talking Point and In Conversation, um, he's, he ventured into other spaces as well. He co-founded uh, Alternate TV and Monsoon Pictures, and he founded Aventura in 2019. Uh, <clears throat> the idea was to meet the demands of the rapidly growing immersive experience economy. And then COVID immersed itself in our midst. And that had a major disruption. That was a major disruption for him. But he's picking, picking things up and moving along. Also in our midst, uh, at Narita Airport, waiting to fly back home to local food is Joshua Cullinan, uh, who's the founder of uh, Thirsty Palette, which is his own company and which kind of explains in its own way what he's about. Joshua used to, is a beverage consultant and lecturer and used to be a high flyer, literally, as cabin crew on Singapore Airlines. Um, and now, he's since then, he's developed his palate for wines, and then later for sake. Uh, he discovered this interest in sake after completing the Certified Wine Educator Examination in Tokyo in 2013. That led to, a va to various other courses and accolades and recognition, including being the first Singaporean to be the sake sommelier of the year in 2018. Uh, and now he's got uh, his own uh, brand of sake, which he suggests uh, put out. I've tried a bit of it. Tastes very good. Tastes very promising. And so he spends a lot of time in Japan looking for new things to do and bring into his label. And making up uh, our trio of panelists, Shalu Vasu of Gamify. Shalu held uh, senior marketing roles in large global organizations. Uh, in in Singapore, he's been in Singapore for more than two decades, um, and he co-founded Gamify in uh, 2023 last year. It's a B2B uh, SaaS platform, 
um, software as a service platform that uses AI-driven tools to help the marketing world. Uh, AI simplifies and speeds up complex marketing tasks. And I had a quick uh, session with him yesterday about it. And it looks very interesting and promising. And it's uh, it's a constantly learning, teaching itself and being fed all kinds of information. So it'll continue to evolve. Um, so it has attracted the interest of a lot of early customers like uh, DBS, Motul, and Rappel's uh, health insurance. And he expects to build on this now that he's also caught the eye of IMDA. I'll just start off uh, by asking each of you at heart, are you an employee or an entrepreneur? And what was the reason for starting your own business? Let's start with you, Christopher. For me, I think uh, it was always about uh, uh, the idea and the passion. Uh, having been in the media industry for the last uh, 30 odd years, I find that I'm driven to uh, creating uh, content, original content. And uh, that was pretty much what inspired me to start my first business, which was Alternative TV, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and then also uh, for Monsoon Pictures, for Aventura, uh, Aventura, of course, uh, in Ital it's an Italian version of the word adventure. And uh, originally, when I started the company in 2019, it was to create immersive, uh, physical immersive experiences, because I was really uh, inspired by a lot of these experiences that I witnessed and I took part in, in in London and in New York, for example. So I wanted to bring some of those kinds of experiences to Singapore. But uh, uh, COVID, of course, uh, happened in, in 2020. Uh, we had to postpone uh, our first event, uh, which we had scheduled in May 2020, and we postponed it twice and eventually decided that it was time to cancel it when things didn't improve. So, um, but it took us about a year before we successfully pivoted to do uh, virtual immersive experiences. Of course, uh, virtual experiences by definition, uh, they are immersive because you're, you're, you're locked into this space where you know, the outside world is, is not part of it. Um, and it, um, as as you said, I mean, for for me, it's it's the passion. It's not like I sat sat down one day and decided that okay, you know, uh, I'm going to start business. What is it going to be? It's it's an idea that's been like uh, in your head and you've been mulling over it for for some time uh, before you decide to take the plunge. So uh, taking the plunge, of course, was just the start of everything, as as you all uh, as you all know. Um, so it was an extension of what you were doing, and you've. And it was also an updating of things, right? Because you were venturing into the new offerings that were available in your industry in terms of uh, the technology at that point uh, in time? Yes. Uh, so apart from, from being in broadcasting and film, uh, it was also about being in the uh, physical attractions business because I worked, I worked uh, for a US company that was creating uh, exhibitions with animatronic uh, like dinosaurs and giant bugs and all that. So... So everything came together in, in a way that that kind of like really excited me, how you can combine, uh, you know, virtual experiences with physical experiences and come up with something that's that's totally like uh, so trendy and exciting for a lot of people right now. And I guess it's also about timing because when we did pivot to the, doing virtual experiences, we found that actually the technology uh, for extended reality, extended reality meaning uh, combining augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality, it's been around for like more than 10 years or so. It kind of like took off in 2014 and kind of like died down. But in the last five years, it's really seeing a revival with the introduction of new hardware and software that has allowed uh, uh, creators to have more accessibility uh, to to the technology, like you know the major players like like Apple is in the game now with its uh, new Apple Vision Pro headset, so so things are really finally showing signs of of taking off despite all the talk in the last ten years. Sometimes it just needs to ramp up, right? So if we were to go to one of your events, what would we see and experience so, that is yeah. different to other? Events? Okay, so right now, uh, what we started with was uh, working with uh, dance companies in Singapore to create immersive dance experiences. So some of it involves basically using uh, the 180 degree uh, or 360 degree cameras to capture performances. 
in 3D that you can view in the headset and, and feel as if you are up there on stage with the performance. So that's, that's that portion. There's also where we just finished uh, just this Saturday, uh, creating a, uh, a multi-sensory spatial VR experience, which you can enter the virtual space, walk around, uh, actually interact with objects, pick up a flower, or, or or even feel feel the physical uh the we we did astro turf on the on the ground but it virtually is actually you're in an enchanted garden so so creating these experiences uh, allow us to then extend beyond just doing uh simply virtual experiences and with the new headsets that uh enable for mixed reality we intend to create uh, more mixed reality experiences where you are attending a physical event, for example, or physical performance, but you can still immerse yourself in a way that will have uh, additional uh, augmented elements in in that uh, in that virtual space. Okay, great. Okay, um, Shalu, let's uh, talk a bit about uh, whether you are an employee, an entrepreneur, and what got you started starting off with uh, Gimify. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I think that there is no, um, you know, clear distinction between the two. I think it's uh, it's a blurry line between the two. And for me, when I look back at my employers, and I've even done a startup and exited a startup earlier as well, the common thread that I saw in all my experiences and working years, Kanan, was that I really enjoy building things, you know, whether it's building and creating a new product or a new brand or launching something in a new market or, uh, or building a platform or a product. Uh, so the common thread for me was I find the joy of building and creating something, uh, you know, above anything else. And therefore, uh, for me, uh, that was the reason why I decided to jump in again and build a uh, Gimify, where we are trying to build the smartest marketer in the world and uh, make her available as a subscription platform for anyone who wants to punch above their weight when it comes to marketing. And uh, I have also been a marketer all my life, Kanan. So I've been on the brand side, I've been on the agency side for a while, I've been on the media side, and therefore I've seen marketing from a 360 perspective. And we put in all our learnings and wisdom and mistakes into building Gimify. And so far the traction has been uh, fantastic and we're looking forward to the journey. Great. So as you said, you've been a marketer all your life, right? So you've been doing all these things. Um, if you had Gamify as a marketer, would things have uh, been very different for you? Uh, yes, Kanan. And even now, you know, when I look at marketers and, you know, I'm sure all of you know marketers as well. You know, the one common thread across is if you talk to a marketer and ask them, hey, how are you doing? So the typical response, you'll get it. Hey, I'm so busy. I've got this event. I've got this ad. I've got this campaign. I got this going on, this website to launch, this Facebook, this Instagram, etc. They're always busy. And many times they're busy doing things that don't really matter that much in the bigger context of things. And therefore, uh, Gimify is an attempt to help marketers get back their time. Gimify helps them to do all their day-to-day -day stuff, content creation, ideation, visuals, um, you know, about a hundred plus things in a in a manner that is that takes a fraction of the time that it takes us, it used to take us originally, and uh, increases the levels of quality, increases the levels of creativity, and in a sense, gives us back the time to be able to do things that really matter. So when I look back, um, you know, I kind of had a similar um, uh, situation where, you know, was busy doing things all the time, not all the things mattered. So I, I quite, um, you know, uh, imagine what I would do with all the extra time, maybe I would be yeah, I would have already, you know, built a couple of startups and exited. So the thing with uh, what Gimify does is it gives you time, but it also means uh, machine is doing a lot of stuff for you. So doesn't that also inject the threat of job losses and concerns about what do I do in this industry now? If somebody else is doing something else is doing a lot of the stuff that I've been doing. That's that's uh, that's always the question, Kanan. And you know, when we see it around us, when new technology comes in, that is kind of the initial reaction. Hey, you know, this machine is going to do this, and therefore, what do people do who were earlier doing this thing on their own? But the way things pan out usually is that you know everyone figures out some new things to do. 
and uh, everyone figure you know it is just like a reallocation of of time and resources and uh, when when gimify helps you do helps you do 60 70 80% of the stuff that we used to do earlier on our own uh, what will happen is that uh, we will find things to do that will add even greater value that will drive our brand even more that will build our business even faster and um, and then you know uh, the the extra resources will go into more productive things and and we as as uh, as mankind as marketers as business people will just end up at a higher level of productivity overall so you you've got a, a class uh, half full and potentially full of perspective to it okay fine um that's great Okay, let's let's go quickly to uh, Joshua. Joshua, so tell us, um, you've I mean you've been a SIA person for the longest time, so you've been an employee for the longest time. So now, as an uh, as an entrepreneur, how is it different, and and why did you take this jump? Yes, I was an employer for thirty years, uh, rising from the rank and um, in management, and COVID was the time that shook <laughs> shook my mind, and and I felt that. Um, I shouldn't be just sitting down and doing what my employer wants. I should use my talent to further advance my 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 professionalism. So that's the reason why um I decided that uh, once COVID, the door was open for the airline, I decided to uh, call it uh, like I say I retire and I just concentrate on my private consulting. That's where uh, Thirsty Ballot was born. Okay. And... Uh... It was wine initially, now sake. So how did that transition take place? Uh, took so many years to study wine. Um, went to the US, UK, Hong Kong, um, New Zealand uh, to get all my wine qualifications. Then um, and in Japan, 2013, I had the interest in sake. So 2014, I continued the interest. I felt that I've had so much experience in um, as a trainer in wine in Singapore Airlines, developing training programs in wines, um, training the start, uh, the crew, new crew on wines and cocktail. And I felt, why don't I go into something um, um, the unexpected, you know, the unknown, because sake is different from wine. It's much more tough because the language and all this. So I took the plunge in 2014. Then um, I became a sake judge. Then I three times I went for international competition. Then the last time in 18, 2018, I won the competition. And I did not stop there, and I felt felt that there's a lot of potential that I can do. So I started teaching sake, um, you know, going to Japan, you know, this. That's how it started. How many uh, non-Japanese are in the business of putting out the sake brands? I think I'm the only non-Jap um, in India in Singapore. <laughs> yep. Okay. So is is that novelty something you were banking on that uh, you might uh, reach out to a wider audience? I mean, was that uh, a factor in deciding what? Uh, that you what you were going to do with Thirsty Palette? Uh, because I felt loyalty can die out, you know. So don't don't stick to loyalty. Uh, stick to your professionalism and your passion. I think that that will carry you through. And maybe in a, in the initial novelty will have some effect, but you need to pursue and you need to show that you are really good in your field. I think that's very important. All of you would have uh, had to have some sort of investment put into what you're trying to do. Um, what was the what was startup cost like for you uh, and was it difficult to master those those funds we're following the traditional startup route canon where uh, as we got started i put in some money of my own my co-founder put in some money of his own and as we started getting some traction we built version one of our platform uh, we were able to get in some customers uh, some really amazing brands who are now using our platform and on the back of that, we started doing our first uh, seed round of fundraising. And we've been lucky. We've got some really amazing investors on board in our seed round. And um, and then, uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier, as that was happening, we've also been recognized by IMDA as a Spark, as an IMDA Spark company. So I think a lot of this positive traction has helped us in uh, in being able to uh, in be, in being in progressing in our fundraising as well. So, um, so yeah, I would say a very traditional startup route. Uh, we started with our own funds, and then along the way, we were able to convince and bring on board some amazing investors. And now we're fine for uh, you know uh, for uh, for the next uh, many months, and we hope to kind of double down and get more traction on the sales and continue building the product. And and hopefully, we'll do uh, another fundraise towards the end of this year and early next year.
Okay, so uh, so there's a plan, right? Uh, so we'll get into that shortly. Uh, Chris, how about yourself? Because your class is also involving uh, some degree of technology, right? Yeah, um, it's a bit different from... Um... Yeah, it's a bit different in the sense that uh, I, I've I've been through that uh, the other route before uh, when I did Alternate TV uh, many years ago. Uh, we did manage to raise some funding there, but uh, this time around, I'm I'm looking at uh, building a uh, sustainable business first, and and developing our products and our services before uh, actually looking for additional funding. So a lot of it is self funded uh, at the moment. And yeah, so so that's the plan for now until I feel that the time is right uh, to actually uh, to expand and to look for additional funding. When you talk about, I suppose this applies to all of you, when you talk about the time is right, uh, how do you determine that? <laughs> because I mean, that can be anything, right? Seriously. <laughs> yeah, what, what sometimes. in your mind plays out when you say, okay, this is right now, now I do it. Uh, it's it's a difficult question, a very important question, but a very difficult one to answer because, uh, especially when you do a technology, it's it's hard to to say that okay, this is going to be uh, it's going to be uh, successful in like five years or ten years because a lot of people entered the extended reality uh, space uh, ten years ago. Some of uh, a lot of them have dropped out because they they. Uh, did not estimate the timing correctly for when it will take off. Uh, so, so it's yeah, it's anyone's guess. But sometimes it just comes down to to luck and and the gut feel that okay, you think you see all these trends, you, you see uh things happening in 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 hardware software space, and you you feel that this is going to be about right time to go in. But even then, I I could still be wrong, right? It's it's yeah, it's hit or miss. So we just cross your fingers and. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Yeah, just just to add to what uh, what what Chris said, I think timing is you know whether it was good or bad. I think it's a lot in the hindsight. You kind of analyze whether the timing was good or not good in in hindsight. I think when you're in it, it's it's quite tricky and difficult to to sort of uh, determine. Hey, is this the right time? Am I doing it at the right time? And you know, should I do it now? Should I do it later? Uh, I think all of this analysis is good in 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 hindsight. Um, but but at the same time, it's important to. Um, to kind of end up being on the right side of timing, as Chris also said, I think. So maybe luck plays a role, but uh, but I think the analysis is is for the hindsight, mostly. So Joshua, for you, uh, what was the determining factor? Is it that good times, bad times, people will drink? <laughs> <laughs> I think both times people will drink. Uh, my startup cost was low because um, I use virtual office. You know? I, I'm literally a one-man show. Actually, uh, people thought then my wife helps me in some areas of uh, social media and all this. So um, I try to keep it lean, keep it lean. That means I use virtual office. Um, I have a warehouse uh, for sake. You know, I have a small warehouse that I keep the stocks for whatever sale I want to do. Small one. I don't have a big one. Then um, I rely a lot on uh, social media to 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 uh, to drive my business. And also um, keep cost down means um, you don't spend money on too much on advertising. I, I know advertising costs and the worst cost I feel is rental, rental of office office space. So um, I think COVID people have learned a lesson that you should use virtual virtual areas too. You know, so don't don't make don't give the money to the landlords. You know, or else the landlords will be in the upper hand. You know, I mean I I, I mean that's that's how for small uh, small fries like we started to think about it having a virtual office because I can work anywhere I want. I can work right now in in Japan, uh, which I was doing from this morning. I can work anywhere so long I have a good connections of, uh, you know, I, just now I was even in Shinkansen for one and a half hours. I was doing my work, you know, so so long the internet, very surprisingly in Japan, underground internet, I mean, with my phone, it works so well. I'm surprised. But in MRT station in Singapore, uh, the, 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 the system gets cut down. I don't know why. <laughs> so um, it's about yourself. Um, keep cost low and um, try to uh, build up your brand gradually. You won't expect instant results, but you will see the results definitely. Like there's such thing called, I, I believe in luck. I also believe in um, uh, your passion. And I think it's very important to drive your passion and to be focused in, in whatever you do. Yeah. Okay, so you, you've been talking about social media. You're, you're, you've got like something like 70,000 plus followers on your 
IG, right? I mean, it's uh, quite an awesome number. And um, what's what, what was your strategy for that? I mean, how did you get your numbers so high? People love to drink. Uh, no, I think first of all, um, SEO is the one that drives uh, uh, followers. Um, be relevant with your posting. Be focused in your posting. Um, don't don't put so much things in a posting, you know. Um, convey one idea, one purpose, and bang on it. And have subsequent postings that comes with it. I think that's very important. And keep posting and don't post for the sake of posting. And people get bored. No, you should post up little messages and little stories and, and keep people excited. And I have people texting me and say, um, when is the next posting coming on? You know, what what's next? You know, what's next? I have strangers in, in Japan this week. Um Five of them are my strangers, which I've never met them before, but they want to see me because they were they were in my Instagram. So you see strangers, you know, they, they want to talk to you. They want to share with you. They want to collaborate with you, even in Japan. So it, it's exciting to see such things, you know. Yeah, But you got to be focused. You gotta, and you got to be real. You got to be real in you know, Instagram. You don't like, um, you know, put fake pictures and whatever. You really need to be real in social media. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's good advice. Uh, it's great to be able to use... Uh, the modern tools in that way as well, right? Christopher and Shalu, I'm sure you would also have seen the benefit of that. And have you had similar experiences or even negative experiences that you can maybe correct uh, that uh, that has helped uh, helped you in your businesses, uh, Shalu? Yeah, I think um, uh, what Joshua said, being real, I think is a really useful and important uh, thing to do. And especially when uh, now it is so easy not to be real because, uh, for example, Gimify itself, uh, you know, we we help marketers punch above their weight by helping them create content for exactly the use cases that Joshua spoke about. Uh, Gimify creates amazing short form content, long form content, visuals, ideas to help marketers, uh, small and 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 large, punch above their weight and get their marketing goals done. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's maybe a, a, a very interesting thing to say, but we need to learn how to use AI so that we can be even more real and we can express our ideas and thoughts and, uh, and, you know, what we want to share in a manner which is human and real, uh, but yet be able to drive our efficiency and our productivity and our creativity by using uh, tools and platforms like Gimify.ai. And that is what I've what I've learned as well, where uh, AI cannot do 100% of the work, but it can help to save 70, 80, 90% of the time that we put in into a variety of marketing tasks. Yeah. There's using your tools, right? Uh, Christopher, how about yourself? Do you use uh, yeah. have much I, use for I, social media? I agree with Shalu. Uh, not, not, well, social media, of course, to, to promote uh, the experiences that we've created and all that, but uh, in, in line with what Shalu said about uh, AI, for example, we found that uh, I mean, in, in spite of the dangers of uh, AI, that AI poses uh, in creating, uh, you know, fake uh, fake news or, or fake images and video and all that, I think uh, everyone should learn how to take advantage of it for uh, for and use it for good because there are a lot of time and cost savings that can you can benefit from using AI. Uh, properly, so so we we've, we've used it in in ideation. For example, like if if we want to create a, an uh, an avatar of someone, for example, we would type in prompts and and we would generate a look and feel of a particular avatar that we can then uh, get our our designer to to then uh, create and customize. So a lot of things environment uh, in the, the virtual environments, uh, you can get the initial uh, creation done using uh, AI tools. So definitely, uh, I, I'm I'm a strong uh, proponent of using AI, but use it use it wisely, use it uh, use it for good rather than than all the negative things that you can use it with. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, so when when it comes to your business, uh, do you, did you develop it with uh, a sort of a plan in mind in terms of where you would like it to be, say in five years, ten years? Uh, were you working towards uh, an exit strategy of sorts, you know, as in I'm going to list, I'm going to be absorbed by a larger company, I'm going to be sold, or I'm just going to carry on doing this. What What was in your mind 
when you first started and did that change as uh, be, as a progress yeah. of course for, for all of you it's all fairly new so that might come a bit later Chris yeah to be honest when I first started of course I didn't, I didn't think about the exit strategy uh, at that time but uh, definitely uh, being of my age <laughs> I, I don't think I want to continue uh, working this hard uh, for the next 20 years for example so so definitely uh, I think the more immediate focus is building a successful business uh, you definitely have to have a plan uh, in place, like where you want to be in five years or in 10 years. You know, you, you can't just say, go along and see what happens. No, you have to have a plan, but also be prepared that you may have to modify your plan as you go along. Um, and, you know, if, if the time comes and you, you think that, oh, it's not viable anymore, then you have to pull the plug. But, but uh, you know, you just, just need to plan to, to, to have these milestones in place uh, that will uh, help you to move towards a successful uh, uh, position. For me, Kanan, like I have, I have a goal uh, in mind, but that is something which is always at the back of my mind. Like that does not play a role in our day-to-day decision-making. It's more like a North Star. So for example, from a, from a mission point of view, we are, we are building the smartest marketer in the world. And uh, and while that is the end goal, uh, we're not getting there next week. We're not getting there in three weeks, in, in maybe a few months. It's more like a North Star, which keeps us on the path and which which sort of, you know, the vision evolves uh, in terms of what that means over a period of time. Uh, and from a business goal point of view, our goal is to become a 100 million ARR or a subscription revenue company in about five to six years time. And, uh, and, you know, while these two are, are kind of the main goals that drive uh, our, our long-term thinking, uh, short-term thinking is, is, you know, is not, you know, is, this is at the back of our mind, but does not really play a role in the short-term decision-making, but that's where we want to end up. And uh, in terms of uh, exit, I, I think more in terms of, uh, you know, an exit is not something that you can always plan for. You can, you can anticipate it, you can think about it, you can, you can kind of, Explore the options, but it happens when it happens, and uh, and you kind of need to keep going on on your journey. And if it happens along the way, great. You know, will you know if it works, then then it'll be uh, it'll be great. But um, uh, for me, especially, you know, like I enjoy building things and getting things off the ground. So once it reaches a stage where I feel that uh, it'll be in better hands, uh, then yeah, maybe three, four, five, six, seven years. Um, you know, happy to think about uh, about that. Uh, so that that's how I think about it, kind of. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Joshua, how about yourself? I mean, yours, I, you you personally invested in the taste and flavor of what you produce, so uh, must be a bit more difficult. I was actually not thinking about exit plan. Actually, I was thinking about expanding. Actually, in in one year, uh, be, uh because uh, my market is not Singapore. Uh, Singapore is very small. So actually, I was thinking um actually I draw plans to um to go to um India, uh, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, you know, and Vietnam. So there were actually a lot of opportunities and uh, you know plans coming up, you know. So um, I I want to spread not just in Singapore, because the market in Singapore is quite small. So I want to use Singapore as a launch pad, then build my brand, build my name, and and uh, you get customers from Asia. It's good enough. So um, actually, I was not thinking about exit. I was actually thinking about uh, growing in Asia. I think I think that's the best okay. way to look. No. At it. Sure. Growth is, uh, I mean, that's what you're in the business for, right? You want to grow and expand. But at some point, you might need to, it might grow beyond your capabilities. It might be, there might be so much potential, but you may not have the resources to fund that potential. So then you might need to look for others to come in. So yes. how easy or difficult is it to work with others? Because you're on your own, right? You're doing this by yourself. Yeah. Do you think you would be able to work with a larger uh, organization that deals in your kind of product, but has its own system in place. Would you be able to work in that sort of environment? I, I believe we can, we can, we can. I mean, there's always such thing called a win-win situation. So um, each company wants certain talent of you, you want certain um, offerings of them. So actually we can meet them in halfway. I mean, everything I think we can, done, you know, I've I've spoken yeah, with business with big companies and so far we work very well actually. Okay, cool. Um, you know, Chris, you you brought up something about pulling the plug, right? How mm -hmm. emotionally attached are all of you to your businesses? 
very <laughs> yes. very yeah. very attached so yeah. what what would pulling the plug mean for you then um what would it do to you i'll be very sad of course <laughs> so but no no intentions at the moment because this is uh, pretty much probably the last business i'm going to be uh, invested in so I'm, i intend to see it uh, for the long haul and as uh, um, as the rest talked about expansion, yeah, I also plan to. Right now, we're doing experiences in Singapore, but uh, we hope to uh, start uh, working on uh, experiences by working with partners in in the region, in in Asia and beyond. Uh, yeah, over the next couple of years. So um, yeah, sad, but but I don't. I'm not thinking about it because I'm really thinking about growth as well uh, and expansion. Okay, Shalu. I think about. I, I think very. I mean, you can't avoid it. You can't help it. It's something that you build. You know, you bring to life, and uh, and therefore you are connected to it. You think about it. You breathe about. You know, you're thinking about it all the time. Uh, but at at the same time, I try and stay focused on uh, doing the right things. And you know, when you're running a business, there's so many things that you. Uh, have no control over and you cannot control the outcome. Uh, but all we can try and do is to focus on, on doing the right thing and giving ourselves the best chance to succeed and then not getting too hassled about uh, what actually ends up happening. Uh, that's what I try and uh, try and focus on. Okay. Joshua? Uh, for me, it's, yeah, there's a lot of passion involved, you know, to do this, you know. And I took a lot of steps to step in, you know, to, to pursue my, you know, of course, you you will feel that you know what happened. It does not work, you know. But sometimes, um, when you start a business, um, you shouldn't think too much about making X amount of dollars first. You should grow incrementally. So when you grow incrementally, you know that you are on the right track. Rather than you want to take on big projects, then in the end you fail. You cannot deliver. You know. So I rather do small, uh, but think big. Then then I will succeed. Rather than I think big. I want to do something big, then I can't fulfill my clients and my reputation is on the line. So I'd rather go slowly. I would rather go in you know, a very slow, but I, I will definitely build in six months' time. You know? So it's about pacing okay. yourself. Okay. So it's more organic as well, right? In that way. Yeah. There's a question here from uh, John who was asking did, what was a light bulb moment? Um, did you have any light bulb moments uh, uh, in the development of your product? Um, Shalu, I'm sure you would have had a, few, a lot of light bulbs. Um, I like there, there isn't one single moment when you say, "Hey, you 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 have this eureka moment," and you get up in the morning and say, "Wow, this is it." I think it's all very incremental. Uh, I think you kind of know the broad direction in which we want to go, and then uh, and then ideas layer one on top of the other, and you end up with uh, with uh, you know what you want to build and the, the platform that we've created. Uh, but at the same time, this is also an ongoing journey. This is an evolution. Like right now, uh, like I shared with you uh, yesterday, kind of like we we are building the smartest marketer in the world. But what we think is the smartest marketer in February 24 might be different from what we think is the smartest marketer in August 24. And therefore, uh, therefore, uh, you know, it, you know, it, it's all I think very incremental. So no one single light bulb moment, but a lot of different. Uh, uh, I, I'm guessing, uh, you know like uh, smaller light moments that get added on and layered onto each other. Okay. Chris, how, Chris, how about this? Yourself, I, any I, light bulb I, moments? I agree, Shalu. It's, it's not one single light bulb moment. Uh, sometimes there are good days and there are bad days, right? And good days, yeah, okay, yeah, this is, this is the right thing that you're doing. And then, you know, maybe uh, two months later, something not so nice happens and then you, you, you start to question yourself whether you're, you're doing the right thing. But uh, it's, it's incremental and you can't expect uh, immediate results. Uh, you just have to stay committed, stay focused and try and meet all the milestones uh, of, your, of your plan and see where it takes you. I think you've got to think differently. Um, definitely, um, when I started this, there are people who, who say why you start this, you know, and some of them feel that you are their competitor, but you have to do it differently. When you do things differently, um, they 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 cannot they cannot copy you know so about light bulbs i mean come on um 
when when you see some things some people are doing something like yours try to do it differently and and you will definitely uh, you know you will see the more light bulbs especially when i sleep sometimes when i wake up i have certain um, ideas that comes up usually about 3 4 o'clock in the morning so i, I sit down and i write it down and in the morning i start doing it and it becomes like a new idea and you know it's like wow i got a new idea you know so okay you got to keep thinking you know, but not not too much of sake actually that's fine yeah, I agree. I agree with Joshua because uh, you know the the business environment these this, these days is very very competitive because you're competing not just with you know uh, other businesses in Singapore, but it's, it's a global thing now. So you have to constantly stay a few steps ahead of your competition, you know, uh, and and look at how you can present something that's unique, that's different from from what everyone else is offering. So like like for for my company. Uh, you know, we are we're not we're not a tech company, so we're not all techies. Uh, there's a very strong creative component as well. So, uh, you know, apart from uh, making sure that you stay keep pace with the technology, uh, I think the advantage that we can bring to the table is that uh, you know we have a strong uh, content uh, 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 base, and then we are able to uh, ideate and and come up with different ideas and approaches to creating different experiences. So so that that will ultimately be a differentiator. Uh, all things being uh, the same with with the technology. Mm. Well, Shala, you raised a point about um, the latest thing in what you're doing in February may not be the latest thing a few months later, right? So how do you? How do all of you sort of uh, maintain the USP of your business, the unique selling point, the you know the thing that uh, makes it special? Uh, how do how do you keep doing that? I mean, do you revisit it? Do you continue to grow it? Do you evolve it? How how does that process work for you, Shalom? I think that we think of our USPs uh, at a level that is above tactical stuff, so that they stay. Uh, relevant for the longer term, uh, as Joshua said, you know you you do things differently from what other people are doing. So for in for example, in our case, we've built a platform for marketers that helps them do all the things that they do in their daily life. And uh, to do things differently, we've broadly done three things. One, we have married the best of all AI technology with the wisdom and the learnings and experiences of the best marketers in the world, so that marketers get the best output. Uh, from Gimify. So that's one thing that we've done differently. Our approach is different from what anyone else has done. Uh, we have also uh, you know, looked at our own careers as marketers and tried to build the platform in a way that makes it really intuitive and simple for marketers to use. And uh, that is also an approach that is different from what everyone else has done. And um, and lastly, we are adding in our own layers of technology based on uh, based on our learnings as uh, as marketers in terms of the features and how you know what would really make it productive for marketers. So we've kept our USPs at a level that would that would uh, stay the course of time that would be long lasting, and we can keep adding more tactical layers to these broad USPs. And and keep them uh, evergreen and keep sort of uh, you know building our brand and positioning around these uh, around these USPs. That's how we're thinking about it, Kanan. Okay, so it's uh, about time we got to wrap this up. But there's a question here that just came in from Edwin. I wanted to re uh, sort of modify it a bit. Uh, he's asking about a support team. I was just wondering, uh, do mentors play a role in uh, your decision making or your processes? Chris? Uh, definitely. Uh, you know, um, I I do keep uh, connected to a lot of uh, people who are leaders in the industry. So uh, definitely whatever uh, information that they share about what they're doing and and, and all that is, is very important information that that I would try to uh, take note of and find a way to incorporate into my business. Um, not necessarily someone that I, I meet regularly, not that kind of mentor, but definitely mentor from the leaders from the industry. Uh, I okay. do do that, yes. Okay. Shalu? Uh, for me, we've taken a slightly different approach where we've actually 
curated and 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 cultivated a team of uh, advisors or an advisory board for gimify and these are some amazing people from the industry some i have known for long some i have known only recently but they bring in different things that i don't have so somebody is an amazing uh, expert in AI, in ai tech and data somebody has amazing connections with the singapore ecosystem somebody is helping us get us a get a foothold in the us and so on and so forth so we've created this team of uh, of advisors and mentors and i think it uh, you know the biggest benefit is that it fast tracks uh, our our progress and gives us uh, speed and gives us uh, you know on occasion amazing connections and uh, and in 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 you know in summary it just helps to speed up things so i think it's a very important part of uh, of of uh, you know building and growing a business it um, it it has worked well for us and uh, we'll we'll keep it uh, try and keep it going that way would uh, at some point gen ai be your mentor uh, that can be everyone's mentor and in fact one of the features on our platform is that uh, uh, we have uh, we have marketing assistants for everyone so in addition to the tasks that you can do we've also created you know created marketing assistants with different skill sets different personalities who you can train on your brand and then they can be your your assistants your mentors for all the tasks that you do on a day to day basis so yes in a way gen ai can fill in some gaps as well okay how about you joshua mentors i actually don't have mentors but actually i have a lot of people from around the world um like from japan i had people in japan taipei um, in the us and all this um we are connected in some form of like a very invisible ecosystem that when i need to ask them something i just email them or you know and i i just go into their messenger and i them they'll be most willing to share the ideas you know so um i can i can tailor make the ideas that they have to a market to suit to the current uh, market i think that's very interesting for me very interesting not not um not buddies or mentors but people who are like minded people that's okay. very interesting great yeah. okay super well look Christopher, uh, Shalu, and Joshua, thank you for joining in from all thank the different areas uh, uh, in this discussion. Uh, I think one of the things that came up for me was the fact that, well, you know, there's no prescribed route. Everybody takes their own path. Uh, the, the entrepreneur's journey is, it can be solitary, it can be lonely, but it can also involve a to group of people. So it's how you want to position it, how you want to take it as you go along. But certainly, you know, the approaches should be what works for you. Yeah. And in some ex and all of you have said the same thing in terms of using technology and trying to make full use of it, right? be it social media, be it uh, how your system will run, or you know whatever new uh, equipment comes uh, that is relevant and in time with what you want to do. So luck, it's timing, it's being at the right place at the right time. But also it's about taking that plunge, isn't it? It's about getting in there and Making that first step, as I was, uh, as you were talking earlier, Chris, you can't win the lottery if you don't buy the ticket, right? So, <laughs> on that note, all the best in all your respective journeys as well. Mm -hmm.